day the Lord has made. All right, three times a charm. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Look at the neighbor and say, neighbor, do you know what today is? This is the day the Lord has made, amen, which means we ought to be excited and we ought to give God our absolute best praise today. Come on, one more again. Put those blessed hands together. Let's celebrate our God. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you and we honor you. God, you're just an awesome, incredible, amazing God. If we had 10,000 tongues, it would be insufficient for us to exclaim and proclaim your goodness. So, Lord, we just simply want to say thank you. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for starting us on our way. Thank you for dealing with us with all of our craziness and all that we have. But God, you have considered, continued to be a consistent, faithful God to us. And for that, we give you glory and praise. So now, God, as we come to the moment of sharing and proclamation, Lord, we know that this season is not always jolly for some. So, Lord, we ask that you would allow us to grow, expand. Thank you for a safe space to reconcile all that this moment means. And so, Lord, I thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ. And I acknowledge the simple fact, God, that you have been better to us than we could have been to ourselves. So now, God, in the time of our sharing, let something be said, let something be experienced that will help us, strengthen us, challenge us in who you want us to be. God, we just love you. And we thank you again. So, Lord, I avail myself to thee. Hide me behind your sacred cross. Let them not see me, but see thee. That is my prayer. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. High five two or three people. Tell them I'm glad you're in church today. I'm glad. One more time, let's give God some glory and some praise. Let's get to work, guys. Book of Matthew chapter 2. We're continuing our series I'm not in the mood, and I want to thank you for being a real mature congregation. We've been dealing with some heavy stuff, and last Sunday was just heavy, heavy, heavy. I told staff, we're going to have to lighten it up a little bit today. Amen. It was just so heavy and draining. Um, but thank you because I know how many were helped uh, with the realities of life. Because I know there's some of you that, you know, life is always perfect. You ain't never had a bad day, you know. Uh, but there's a few of us that can testify, no, that ain't real, Pastor. I, I done had some ups and some downs and some, and so it's good to have a space where you can kind of just be with the reality of, of, of what life is all about. That's why I love the Bible because it is a story of real people with real problems and real issues. And so um, that's the amazing thing about the connectivity that God grants us. And so we'll continue that again. And so as we talked about Herod and the parents who lost their children, I invite you to Matthew chapter 2. We can read it around verse 13. Go to verse 15, then I'll ask you to skip on down to verse 19. And so I'm reading from the message translation. <clears throat> this is the word of God. After the scholars were gone, God's angels showed up again in Joseph's dream and commanded, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, stay until further notice. <laughs> Herod is on the hunt for this child and wants to kill him. Joseph obeyed. He got up, took the child and his mother under cover of darkness. They were out of town and well on their way by daylight. They lived in Egypt until Herod's death. This Egyptian exile fulfilled what Hosea had preached. I called my son out of Egypt. Go down to verse 19. Later when Herod died, God's angel appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Up take the child and his mother and return to Israel. All those out of murder, the child are dead. Joseph obeyed, got up, took the child and his mother and re-entered Israel. When he heard, though, that Archelaus had succeeded his father Herod as king in Judea, he was afraid to go there. But then Joseph was directing a dream to go to the hills of Galilee. On arrival, he settled in the village of Nazareth. This move was a fulfillment of the prophetic words, he shall be called a Nazarene. Well, time which is ours, let me trouble your patience again as we end the third installment of this sermon series. I want to preach from this thought. I don't feel like losing my mind. I don't feel like losing my mind. Lift those hands for heaven. Say, Lord, speak. We need to hear. You may be seated in the presence of our God. <clears throat> it was once pointedly said, and I truly believe it is true. If you want to make God laugh, tell God your plans. 
How many of us have done that? I mean, honestly, in our minds, we already can map out certain things, trajectories and wishes and things that we feel like are best for us. I mean, even as children, we're taught to plan ahead. We can tell ourselves what school we're going to go to, who, when we're going to get married, how much money we're going to make. It seems like life for us is better when it's planned out. I mean, that's what they tell us, that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And so for us, we're ingrained in our mindset and the things that we want to accomplish. And so we try to put things in order because order gives us some sense of normalcy. If I have a plan, if I have an idea, then that's the way that I want things to go. And most of us oftentimes settle in the routine of what we feel things should be. The challenge with that, my brothers and sisters, and I don't know how many are with me on this, but I want to suggest that oftentimes you can come up with all the plans you want to come up. You can line your life how you want to line it up. If it does not agree with God's will, it will never come to pass. And there's someone here under the sound of my voice. You're not going to say it out loud, of course, not in this sacred space, but there's a part of you that screams out in anger to God because there are many moments that you wish God would do it how you want God to do it. And oftentimes you feel like God is squeezing you and frustrating you because the plan you had for your life is not this perceived plan that God is ordering for your life. What do you rest, how do you manage that tension of these things that are happening and you want to be honest and you want to be faithful, you want to follow through in fidelity to God, but there are many moments you're saying, God, this is not what I signed up for, this is not what I asked for, and I feel as if the more I try to figure it out, the more I seem lost in what you're trying to accomplish. And my brothers and sisters, I think that even in new additions, even when blessings may come in, the, the blessings and transitions cause some things to just happen. And if we're honest, new causes shifts and shifts call transitions and transitions can lead to frustrations. Have you ever had a blessing feel like a burden? And those are rough places to be. I mean, stuff that you know God has ordained, but there's still a part of you that's saying, I didn't sign up for all of this. That, that's what leads us to our character today, a man by the name of Joseph. And we know his story, I would suggest, uh, from a cursory perspective. I mean, we see him in the narrative. We see him as the husband of Mary, the caretaker of Jesus Christ. But I submit to you today, my brothers and sisters, that even if Joseph was to grab the microphone today, he would submit to you that this moment of Christmas, this whole holiday season for him, was a moment of tension and mental fatigue. Because if you look at the narrative of Joseph, even though we don't know much about him. He was a carpenter, which means he's a man that is used to planning things out. But yet our narrative seems to suggest to us that no matter his plans, God had other plans. And because of God's other plans, it leads him to this place of frustration, this place of mental fatigue, where he's trying to figure out, I want to stay together, but I feel as if I'm losing my mind. Who am I talking to today that I would submit to you? The worst fatigue is mental fatigue. I mean, I can take physical fatigue. That's, you can take a nap and kind of remedy that. But what happens when your mind is just trying to wrap itself around what's going on and there you are trying to make sense out of stuff that does not make sense. And my brothers and sisters, I think that we can learn something from Joseph in our text that at the end of the day, no matter what your plans may be, you're going to be frustrated if you try to superimpose your ideas, your plans, your visions, and your dreams on God. That at some point, you got to learn how to let go and let God and say, God, even if I don't understand it, I'm still going to trust you to work this thing out for my good. Is there anybody that's ever came to that place to say, you know what, Pastor, that's where I need to be, where I'm in full release and I understand that there are things that are out of my control and even though I cannot do anything with what life deals me I can respond in a way that honors you and still says that even though I may not understand it even if I don't like it I'm still going to trust you to do exactly what you need to do and when we come to that realization, the day child of God, I really believe that it begins to allow us to experience God in ways we never experienced him before. What if I told you that you need to be frustrated to learn how to trust him more? What if I told you you need to be stretched to learn that God is still working it out on your behalf? What if I told you you need to get to the edge of your sanity to learn that God is the one that keeps your mind, keeps your heart, and keeps everything in perfect peace? Who am I preaching to that can testify that you got to a 
a place where you were just at this point of giving up and it was at that spot that God taught you is that when you finally learn that you can't control this when you finally learn that you can't have the final say is when you finally learn that God has been working everything out God has been knowing better to me if I would have just trusted him from the beginning he would have made everything work out on my behalf and I will lift that up today, my brothers and sisters. I think we can glean some things from this concept, this narrative of Joseph today. I, I think that if we see this encounter between Joseph and what it means as he once again is thrust into the midst of this whole notion of, of being around when Christ is born, it will share some truths with us that will allow us to understand how to navigate these tensions, these moments of mental fatigue, that when we feel like losing our mind, God can step in and work it for our good. Let me share a couple of notes I think that is pertinent from this particular narrative. The text would first of all tell us, I hope that you would take this down. This is the first principle. I'm trying to help someone's sanity today. Maybe God sent me on assignment to grant you peace of mind even in the chaos. God simply wants me to tell you first of all that accepting the promises of God comes at a risk to our reputations. That, that when God calls you to something, you got to be willing to submit to being ridiculed. The story of Joseph has always intrigued me. He is an interesting character in Scripture. And, and one of the reasons I say that is because not a lot of information is said about Joseph. As famous as he is, we have limited amount of information. I mean, we don't know when he's born. We don't even know when, we, when he dies. Scripture is very silent about the impact he has on the life of the family of Mary and the children and Jesus. We, we don't know any of that. We just know a few tidbits that we can somehow try to piece together to try to get some idea of perhaps what his life could actually be. Well, we know number one, he's from the tribe of David. We understand he's from that lineage of Judah. So we understand that perhaps he is a, a Jew. We know he's a Jew, a consistent, compassionate Jew. Number two, we know he's a carpenter and that doesn't necessarily mean he works with wood in those days carpenters work with stone so the better rendering is that he's a stone mason so he's from the tribe of Judah he is from the uh, he's a stone mason carpenter and we do know he's betrothed he's engaged to a woman by the name of Mary those three things kind of outline for us really the trajectory of his life he goes to the temple regularly he has a steady job and in those days you don't shift jobs when you are a carpenter you go die a carpenter so in his mind he's probably getting ready to project out what his family lineage is going to be like how he's going to provide for his family as a carpenter and you can imagine he's betrothed to a woman named Mary he's thinking to himself we get married we have some children we live happily ever after. That's all he's thinking is that I'm going to go to temple. I'm going to work as a carpenter. I'm going to marry Mary. We're going to have children and live happily ever after. That was his plan. That was the way things were going to go in his mind, in his journal. That's the way life is going to be until one day. We're not sure how she got his attention because in those days you were not even supposed to be having communication with those you betrothed to. But we don't know what happened. She didn't tweet him. She didn't text him. She didn't DM him. We're not sure how she got in the opportunity to have a conversation. But when she did, she decided to drop a bombshell on Joseph. She didn't tell him about what she wanted out of the wedding. She did not tell him about their future aspirations. This is what she told Joseph. She said, Joseph, I need to let you know I'm pregnant. Y'all so saved. Y'all about to save. That's 9 o'clock. Now, 11.15 was a little different. 9.45 was a little raucous. 7.15 is really stable. I thought y'all would at least kind of roll with me on that one. But I can tell y'all a little more saved than the other congregations. Did you hear what I said? There is Joseph thinking he's going to live his life going to the temple. He's going to be a carpenter the rest of his life. He's marrying Mary. He's thinking everything is going to be copacetic until one day she drops in to have a conversation. And what she says to him cataclysmically changes everything. She says, Joseph... I'm pregnant. But don't stress it. I'm pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Y'all so say, I love it. I know. Y'all so spiritual. If it been y'all can already tell, if you was Joseph, you'd be like, that's good. Let God do what God's going to do in our lives, and we'll be able to let this work. Oh, God is up to something. Come on, let's be real, guys. If you were in the shoes of Joseph, and the person you thought you was going to invest the rest of your life with came to you with some life-altering information, the first words out your mouth is not, bless the Lord. It's not, everything's going to be well. Now there's going to be some windshields being busted. There's going to be some tires being stuck. Come on, let's be honest. An emotional enragement would happen. Why? Because once again, this one announcement was going to shift all of his plans. 
And as you read the text, Matthew 1 does not sanitize the reality. In other words, Joseph has to make a decision because of what is happening to her. He has to make a decision. And the one decision he comes with in his flesh is I need to get rid of Mary. I got two options, either why I can get rid of her publicly or get rid of her privately. You must understand, in those days, to be married was a transaction. The families would pay a dowry, that that was a major part of it. And so now her being pregnant without there being any kind of consummation between her and Joseph meant that somehow these goods that were purchased were no longer no good. So what he would have to do is he would get rid of her publicly. This by law, he could take her to her father's house and have her stoned on the front steps. Things were drastic in those days. That's how they could have handled it. But y'all know the story. You read it. It says that Joseph decides to put her away privately. What does that mean, put her away privately? I've heard people theologi uh, theologize that and talk about how, well, that shows how godly he is. No, let's be honest. When he says put her away privately, what Joseph was trying to do was not just trying to, he wasn't trying to protect Mary as much as he was trying to protect himself. Because in the area for which they lived in, it was not a large city, maybe 1,500 to 2,000 people, which means everybody knew everybody. And if you ever come from a space like that, that can be good and that can be bad. That means that everybody knows your business. So you can imagine for him, he's thinking to himself, how am I going to get out of this? Because everybody knows what's happening. After a while, she's going to start showing and they know we're not married. And so somehow they're going to come up with all kind of conclusions. And it's not just going to look bad on her. It's going to look bad on me. Can you imagine the tension that Joseph is wrestling with to have the woman he thought he was going to spend the rest of his life with say she's pregnant with a child from God? And it becomes so bad because if you're in the shoes of Joseph, you didn't ask for this. You didn't pray for this. This was not in your plan. But this is what God decides that you're going to have to handle. I wish I had some gifted people in the house that could sometimes feel Mary and Joseph in the text. Because there's some stuff you want to really be honest and get on top of a mountain and scream to everybody, I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask to be anointed. I ain't asked to be gifted. I didn't ask to have the platform. I didn't pray for Matter of fact, I had my own dreams and my own aspirations. And now God has thrown this on me and I've got to deal with the repercussions because I got people around me that are now trying to make sense out of something that don't even make sense to me. And I'm having to be in the line of frustration and ridicule all because God decided to give me something I didn't ask for. See, it's one thing when God blesses you with something you asked for. It's a one thing when God gives you something you prayed for. But what do you do? do uh, when God decides to disrupt your life with something you didn't ask for you didn't pray for uh, and it's going to drastically change not just you uh, but also how people perceive you I wish I had some real people that can look over life and say PG man I've been thinking it was just me because I wish God would have had a town hall meeting uh, and told everybody look here that's my child uh, I'm the pappy of that baby uh, Joseph is my boy he's favored by God uh, but God didn't talk to the people he he talked to Mary and he talked to Joseph and he expected them to trust him and take him at his word even if everybody else didn't understand it. I want to talk to some people that feel strange and weird and peculiar because of the call of God on your life and there you are struggling and wrestling because you want to fit in but you don't fit in. You want to be like everybody else but you're not called to be like everybody else. What do you do when God smears you with something that you can't even explain yourself and it causes people to look at you strange and weird. And here's the reality. You ain't really been chosen by God until you had to face some criticism. See, some of you that really have been gifted realize that sometimes you don't know it's God until there's a whole lot of confusion surrounding it. I know, I know you thought that if God did it, he's going to open up the sky and everybody's going to be excited and sing hallelujah. But that's not how this thing works. Sometimes God endows giftedness to people that invites ridicule from everyone around them. And if you have not been ostracized by friends and family, I have to question if you've ever been gifted. Because when you've been gifted, it's going to cause you to be isolated. When you've been gifted, it's going to cause you to be looked down upon. When you've been gifted, it's when you're going to have to struggle trying to make men's with something that don't even make sense to you yourself. The text tells us that he throws this upon them. And part of the problem is, my brothers and sisters, you must know that accepting the promises of God will oftentimes invite criticism. 
But there's another layer to this, my brothers and sisters, because I also want to submit, secondly, that discerning divine moments challenges the faithfulness of our responses. That on one hand, the promise God gives me oftentimes disrupts my public perception. But then these encounters with God will test if I'm as faithful as I say I am. Because even though we don't get a lot of information about Joseph, in the span of two chapters, he has three divine encounters. Matthew 1, when he's trying to figure out what to do with Mary, in a dream, an angel comes to him and tells him that God said it's cool. He's confirming that Mary's telling the truth and you need to take her as your wife. In Matthew chapter 2, when the child is born, Herod gets on a murderous rampage. In another dream, an angel comes and tells him, God says, take your child and take the wife and flee into Egypt until Herod dies. Again, for the third time in Matthew 2, he gets another dream. An angel comes and says, check this out. Herod's dead. You can take the child and the wife and go back home where you came from. In the span of two chapters, there's three divine encounters that Joseph has. In Matthew 1, he's trying to figure out what I do with Mary. Angel comes and say, listen, God says she's telling the truth, take her as your wife. In Matthew 2, Herod is out for a murderous rampage. Angel says, take the child and the wife and go to Egypt. And for the third time, he's dreaming in Egypt, and he says, all right, Herod's dead. Take the child and your wife and go back where you came from. And at the end of every experience, after every dream, after every angelic ex explanation, this is what the text simply says is how Joseph responds. The Bible says this one simple phrase, and Joseph obeys. Okay. <clears throat> Matthew 1, he don't know what to do with Mary. Dreams, angel comes, God says she's telling the truth. Take her as your wife. In Matthew 2, Herod's trying to kill the child. Angel comes, take the child and the wife and go to Egypt. In chapter 2, again, angel says, listen, Herod's dead. Take the wife and the child and go back home. After each divine encounter, the Bible simply says, and Joseph obeyed. Okay, I see why that's not seductive enough for you because for many of us, we expect the favor of God to come through some obstacle. We, we think that unless God tells us to touch 17 people or do 17 laps around the sanctuary, that we can't never see God experience or dispense favor in our lives. But what if I told you that favor is not predicated upon what section you seat in the sanctuary, that favor is not predicated upon how many ministries you serve in, but if you want to experience the favor of God, if you want God to put super on your natural this is all you have to do obey his word that literally whatever God says for you to do if you do what he says is what invites favor it's what invites power it's what invites passion into your life I know that ain't gonna make everybody happy but a few of you under the sound of my voice can say PG that's what I've been finally learning it's been a hard road but there's been some moments I've been banging my head up against the wall trying to figure out how can I progress how can I get better until I finally read the part in scripture that said obedience is better than sacrifice which means it's not my job to tell God what to do it's simply my job to do whatever God says I take his word I apply it to my life and I'm obedient to the word why because when I'm obedient it's what bursts favor in my experience that's why Thomas Kempis was correct when he offered this opportunity to my brother and sister, he said that God, what God honors God is rapid obedience because delayed obedience is nothing more than disobedience, which means the best way to respond to God is when he tells you to do something, just do it. You don't have to figure it out. Just do what he says do. That's what we learned from a player by the name of Roger Starback. Anybody know old school football? He was a quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. And he gave an interview during his playing days where he talked about how he was challenged in playing for the Dallas Cowboys. And his challenge wasn't with his teammates. It wasn't with his opposing players. It wasn't with the front office. He said his biggest challenge he had playing for the Cowboys was the head coach. Head coach, while Roger Starback was quarterback of Dallas Cowboys, was a man by the name of Tom Landry. He's one of the most successful coaches 
in all of professional football. But Roger Staubach said he had a problem with Tom Landry. The problem was Tom Landry never let him call his own plays. He said, man, Tom Landry was so strict in the game plan that Tom Landry told them when to run. He told them when to pass. And he said, Roger Staubach said that while he was playing, he felt frustrated because he felt that he had some good ideas. He felt he had a good game plan, but all the time, Coach Landry, would say, no, unless you run my play, you don't have to be in the game. In other words, what he was literally telling him is that unless you do what I say do, you will never be successful. It wasn't until Roger Staubach, in retrospect, begins to look back on his career as he's getting enshrined in the Hall of Fame, as they won a world championship in 1971. He came to the conclusion that, you know what, maybe I was wrong. That I may have wanted to call my own plays, but when I look back over the span of my career, I didn't do half bad just running the play that was already called. Which means I don't have to be so enthralled with trying to figure out if I should call the right play. I got somebody that's above me that knows the right game plan and knows what it takes to win. So my job is not to call the play. My job is to run the play like it's been called. Y'all missing what I'm saying? Because some of you mad at God Because you had your own game plan And you wanted to tell God when to pass And you want to tell God when to run And you want to tell God when to punt And you want to tell God when to take a knee But God is like Tom Landry In this game, you're going to run the play He calls for you But I got a few people under the sound of my voice That can look back over your life And say, you know what, he's been calling some good plays The whole time And when I look at where I am It's not because I made good decisions but because I had a God that knew better than me which way I should go and what I should do. I wish I had somebody lean over to him and say, neighbor, just run the play. Stop trying to be smarter than you are. Stop trying to figure this thing out. God is going to tell you the right play to run. It's our job is just to do exactly what he said. He tells us in this passage that, that this promise on always make you look good. He also tells us that what hinges our favor is our willingness to obey. But there's something else in this text too as I get ready to get out of here. The third thing I see in this passage is that it lets us know that trusting transitions through inconvenience aligns us to destiny. What I'm simply trying to convey is that what we learn in the life of Joseph is that God will take inconvenient moments and inconvenient places to bring out of you something that's going to accomplish his will. Because that's the text, guys. Notice what the Bible says. That when Herod comes in, the angel comes and tells Joseph how to respond. He says, to avoid Herod, to escape Herod, take the child and the wife and flee into Egypt. Text then said that while he's in Egypt, angel comes back. Herod's dead. Now, take the child and the wife and go back home. Why well, he's going back home, come to find out Herod has died, but they've broken up his province into three parts. His three sons are now leading the provinces that Herod the Great had led. And where they came from was one of the worst sons that Herod had. So in another dream, the angel tells him, well, it's okay, settle in Nazareth. Now, anybody knows anything about scripture, these two places that he had to go for refuge is not what we would call places of top priority. They're not destination places. I mean, in Scripture, no one wanted to go to Egypt. In Scripture, no one wanted to go to Nazareth. Matter of fact, if we take it from a look in the, in the whole symbolism of Scripture, Egypt represented the place of captivity. It, it was a place of oppression. 450 years, the ancestors and the foreparents of Joseph, once again, had to be under the oppressive rule of this pharaoh. And so we look at Egypt in scripture as a place of pain and problems. No one wants to go to Egypt. But then also Nazareth is where he ends up residing. Matter of fact, it's the place where Jesus grows up at. And if you really begin to look at it, Nazareth is even worse than Egypt. Because if you look at a map of this day and a map of this place, you'll note that you cannot find Nazareth on the map. It was such a small community, small town, they didn't even think about trying to highlight it with other towns. Matter of fact, 
as Jesus got older and some of his future disciples were trying to figure out should we hang with him or not, one of them says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? So Egypt is not a good place to go and Nazareth is not a good place to go, but when God was trying to move Joseph, to keep Joseph, to sustain Joseph, to bring promise in Joseph's life, he made him go through Egypt and he made him go through Nazareth. It was not his choice. It was not first on his list, but it was the places that God had ordained for him to go to accomplish his will. Matter of fact, when you read Matthew, Matthew put some word on the places that when they went to Egypt, he said so that Hosea was prophetic when he says, and my son shall come out of Egypt. And when they went to Nazareth, he says so that he shall be called a Nazarene. In other words, even though these were not places that they wanted to go. They were places that God was going to accomplish God's best will for their life. Okay, let me see if I can illustrate it this way. If, if you ever get a chance in Africa, there's what's called an African impala. African impala is a nice graceful animal. It can jump 10 feet high. It can jump 30 feet wide. It's a rather graceful animal. But they begun to domesticate these African impalas. And if you ever go to a zoo and see them, you'll note uh, that these graceful animals that can jump 10 feet high and can jump 30 feet wide, when you go see them in captivity, you'll note they're not behind barbed wire. They're not behind large fences. Matter of fact, the barriers that are used to enclose African impalas uh, is about a fence as tall as three feet. Three feet is as large as the barriers are. And, and so these barriers of three feet are able to hinder and stop the progress, stop the escape of an African Apollo. Now you're asking the same question I'm asking. It can jump 10 feet straight in the air. It can jump 30 feet out wide. So if it can jump 10 feet in the air and if it can jump 30 feet wide, why is a three foot high fence able to keep these African impalas in place. Well, they were kind of confused about this, so they did a little research, and come to find out, they figured out what happens with the African impala. The African impala, even though it can leap 10 feet in the air and leap 30 feet out, it has a problem. It's afraid to leap in places where it does not know where its feet is going to land. And so since they are more concerned with where they're landing, they will not do what is needed to leap in the first place. So they'll let something beneath them keep them hindered because they are so concerned about where they end up that they do not make the faithful stewardship of understanding. It's not my job to worry about where I land. It's simply my job to just leap when I need to. Y'all catching me in a second. And I believe I'm talking to some African impalas in the house. Uh, that you got all the potential in the world you got all of the gifts in the world but you trying to figure out where you want to be uh, you're trying to figure out where you want to land and so you're more concerned about what you want when God said your job uh, is not to be concerned about the landing uh, your job is to simply leap uh, because I'll let you land where you need to land uh, because I always have you land in the place of purpose some of y'all missing what I'm talking about and that's why some of you can't celebrate what God is doing in your life because you're still mad that God sent you through Egypt and God sent you through Nazareth and that was not your first pick but somebody can testify that when I look back in hindsight God was setting the whole thing up from the beginning and he knew that I would be better off going through Egypt and going through Nazareth because that was what he needed to accomplish his perfect will in my life so I've learned in this season not to complain about what I don't have. I don't complain about where I'm not, but I've learned to look back and say, God, even if it don't make sense, even if it's not what I would choose to do, because I submit myself to your will, whichever way you want me to go, Lord, I'll do whatever you need me to do. I feel like preaching here now. Grab someone by the hand and say, neighbor, don't get mad that he didn't do what you wanted him to do, but learn how to celebrate that we serve a God that orders our steps.
in his way which means if I gotta go through Egypt there's purpose in Egypt if I gotta end up in Nazareth there's purpose in Nazareth and I made up my mind he's still God whether it's in Egypt or Nazareth he's still God and as long as he's still God he still can turn it around for my good I gotta get out of here I done sweated up my dashiki but slip your arms around the neighbor shake that neighbor real good shake them till they feel good shake them till they feel like they got the Holy Ghost y'all standing there shake that neighbor and said neighbor take that frown off your face I know you may not be where you wanna be but the God I serve He'll put you where you need to be and ought to have somebody that can open your mouth and say thank you Lord for doing what you do best for making a way out of no way if you believe it open your mouth and shout glory open your mouth and give them praise if you know can't nobody do you like chill? Can nobody do you like the Lord? If you believe it, shout it. Yeah. Shout it. Yeah. Shout it. Yeah. Shout it. Yeah. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Look at another neighbor and said neighbor this next shout is because i trust that god is ordering my step that next shout is because i believe he knows better than me shout it somebody tell them you where you supposed to be you where you supposed to be instead of getting mad about where you're not celebrate where you are because God got purpose in your placement everyone stand it everyone stand it God said, look. God said, I'm not obligated to do your will. But God is obligated simply to do this, his will. And the hardest prayer you can pray is not my will. Thine will be At the end of the day, here it is, Sam. You want favor? Obey. You want promotion? Obey. This ain't complicated. This ain't nothing to confuse you. It's simply saying, listen, just take me at my word. And I know you're frustrated. And I know you're mad because you want to figure this thing out. Can I tell you? His ways are not our ways. And here's the crazy thing about God. God will do stuff that seemingly seems contradictory to position you where he wants you to be. He'll tell a wrong turn right. And he'll do stuff that at the end of the day, you got to look back and say, man, that was nobody. With my choice, and I was angry, and I was frustrated. But when I see where I am now, I see God was, was working this thing out. I don't know where y'all rush this, rush this altar. I'm talking to some frustrated people who said, Preacher, I needed that word today because I, I was getting mad. And sometimes we can be so frustrated that we miss what God is doing. And if you miss it, it ain't God's fault. 
Part of the sermon is saying, you know what, let me get to the place where I have to let my will die for his will to live. Growing up, I can tell you my whole life, all I wanted to be was a lawyer. That's all I wanted, Twan. Be Johnny Cochran, that was it. If it don't fit, must it quit. That was my heart. That's all I had a desire to do. In high school, I took an internship at a law firm because I knew I was going to be a lawyer. All I wanted to do, that was my heart. That was my aim. And it seemed like everything that I tried to put in place to do it, every door kept closing. And I was angry with God because I wanted to be this lawyer. Not realizing that God had other plans because God knew best what he needed to accomplish in my life. And the point finally came to you when I said, you know what? Maybe this just ain't meant for me to do what I want to do. But maybe it's meant for God to do what he wants to do through me. It takes me on this odyssey, this crazy trajectory of stuff that didn't even make sense. Going to schools that I wasn't even trying to go to. Lending me to a, being a ministry at, in Salem, Alabama. I ain't never heard of no Salem, Alabama. And then after serving there, sending me to a place called Augusta, Georgia. Never heard of Augusta, Georgia. The Masters. James Brown. But I didn't see Augusta in my future. And here we are 13 years later. Because can I tell you, the most dangerous response you can give to God is yes. Somebody missed what I just said. The most dangerous thing you can say, God, you know what? Yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Because yes, one yes leads to another opportunity to say yes again. And I'm talking to some people that honestly, I'm with you. I feel you. It can be frustrating because you have your desires and you have your plans. And here is God saying, nope. Nope. That's not it. And you keep trying to go this way and God closes the door. Nope. And it's a tough place to be when God forces you to do what he wants you to do. That's why after a while, you might as well say yes, because he's going to stop stripping everything that becomes an option or obstacle or distraction for you accepting. So you either willingly accept it, or you're just going to be, it's going to be thrown upon you. And it's mental fatigue, it's frustration, and we're angry, and we're tired, not realizing that you need Egypt, and you need Nazareth, and you need these places because it's God's development to produce out of you what he's placed in you. And it ain't going to make sense to other people because your calling is not based on them. That's why it's going to be strange and that's why it's going to be tension and that's why it's going to be, it's going to be some, some stuff that's going to be upsetting because when you really called by God, people ain't going to understand you. And you got to accept that and be okay with that and say, okay, fine, it's okay. I'm called to be peculiar. I'm called to be strange. I'm called to be kind of different in this moment as your head is bowed I, I'm not sure what you need to submit to today but I will say this continue to start trusting God see God's playbook is so unique anybody that's a good football strategist knows that not every play is meant to take you forward some plays are called for an intentional loss because some losses reposition you. So not every move is to go forward. But some moves are to put you in a better position to then move forward. And I've got to learn how to discern 
what God is trying to accomplish in the different seasons that God wants to accomplish. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we honor you and we bless you and we glorify you. We give you glory today. What, what a frustrating moment to know that we don't always get our way. And when it's tense and it's tough and it's difficult and it's hard and God, our prayer is give us the strength and the capacity to choose your will over our own will. God, we recognize what Joseph was wrestling with in this text. Something he didn't ask for, something that was going to cost him, but he still obeyed anyhow. God, God, give us that radical kind of commitment to obedience now. That realize that favor is predicated on simply taking you at your word. Lord, forgive us for the time we try to finagle it our way and try to do things our way. It's not what you wanted. It's not how you had dictated things to be. So Lord, I pray in this moment that you would give us this unrelenting commitment to simply honor you through obedience to your word. Not to wrestle, not to fight, not to buck, but just to do. And Lord, I thank you that I don't operate by my sight, I operate by my faith. Realizing we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Lord, thank you for the inconveniences of life. The challenge me. Because Lord, as I look back over my journey, I've ended up in places I didn't choose to be. I didn't want to be but I realized it was meant for me to be there. Thank you for every Egypt. Thank you for every Nazareth. There, thank you for every place of purpose that you ordained for our lives. And even if it didn't match up to our plan, that's okay. Not my will, but thine will be done. So Lord, I squeeze my neighbor's hand. I want them to know just trust. Let go, let God. And see what God does. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hug somebody on your left and right and tell them, just trust them, just trust them, just trust them. As you make your way back to the seat, as we're all standing, doors of the church is open. If there's one today that does not know Christ for yourself, this is a wonderful opportunity to once again be in his presence and make that commitment. We invite you to come as we all stand all over the building. We're going to let you go. But maybe there's one today that says, I need to have that committed relationship with Christ. We want you to stand. If you're here and do not know him for yourself, what a great opportunity to once again be in relationship if you're here. I see you coming. God bless you. There's some. Come on, let's bless God for those who are coming. Listen, if there's others who say, listen, I'm, I'm saved, Pastor, but I do need to make a commitment to the church. If you're here today and do not have a church home, come on. We would absolutely love to have you. A place of growth, a place of maturation, a place of community, a place of fellowship. If you're here, come. We would absolutely love to have that. Listen, I know that we've prayed out, but the church service is not over. Do me a favor. Can you encourage someone on your left and right and say, neighbor, I will absolutely love for you to make that commitment today. I'm, I'm so committed to it that I will walk with you, whether it's to be saved or whether it's to join the church. We will absolutely love for you to be a part of our family. Come on, if you're here. Come on, if you're here. We would love for you to be here. If you're here, I'm sensing there's others that want to make that step. Come on. Come on. Can you be the evangelist on your section? Can you be the evangelist in your section and say, come on. Soon Start to worry I see some movement come. I see some worry movement. I see you coming. God bless you. There's another. I let go and I let God. Let God have his way. Come on, doors are open. Come on. I see you coming. God bless you. Come on. I stop looking at back way.
There's still time. Come on. Soon as I There's still time. Come on. But wait on you, even if you're about to come. There's still time. Come on, one more time. Come on. I let go and I let God. Let God have his way. I see you coming. Come on. God bless you. Come. Can we thank God for the three who've come today? We celebrate you. Do y'all mind standing? I don't put you on the spot. But we're just a welcoming church. Come on, Tabernacle. Let's thank God for our new family members. God bless you. I love those shoes. They are incredible. Listen, we're excited to have you. been praying for you. That's been our prayer. It's God not to add to our number because we're trying to be larger, but we ask God to add to our number so we can continue to make an impact. And God has answered that prayer and continually does it. Just astounding. And we're so honored. And really humble that you would see this as a place of growth and maturation. Look around. This is family. That's what we are. We're family. We're family. And we love you. We're grateful for you. I say this all the time, and I really do mean it. The best is yet to come. One of our connection teams, Sister Shannon, is going to take it just so we get some information. Come on, guys. Let's celebrate our new family members. Let's thank God for them. Listen, it's frustrating, but trust me, my brothers and sisters, just trust God.